Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast, where we teach clients how to build wealth and create passive income without the risk of Wall Street. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Cameron. Looking forward to this as we're diving deeper into Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And you want to know where we're at in the book, Cameron? I, I know where we're at, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, we are in, and let me finish before you start jumping to conclusions. We're in the wax on, wax off portion. Oh, Right, little karate kid yeah, reference. exactly. Karate the kid. the like karate it. kid. Like if you, if you remember the karate kid, I think you, uh, you were probably like three when it came out. Nope, huge fan. Huge but, fan. You know, at the, at the beginning, he he wants to learn how to do karate, but Mr. Miyagi is making him wax the cars and sweep and sweep the floor, and then he's he's getting frustrated. Well, I want to just learn how to do karate, and then finally. Miyagi puts it all together and says, okay, show me wax on. And he throws a punch at him and he blocks it. Right. We're almost there to the end of the, we're almost to that critical scene of the movie or the book. Like right now, some people may get frustrated because we're halfway through the book and we haven't really talked much about life, you know, how to actually use this. But Nelson, the, the, re, the only way, the only way IBC will not work is if you don't follow the program. Mm. And that's why he's taken so much time to incorporate the human factors. And that's what we're going to talk about today are these, are these four or there are five um, human factors. And in order to do this properly, you need to understand these and be able to, to overcome these human factors. And that's what we're talking about today. And also, as you know, I'm also, I started watching Cobra Kai, right? Which if you haven't, if you haven't watched Cobra Kai, if you are a fan of Karate Kid or were Cobra Kai, you're going to love Cobra Kai. It's, it's like the same characters, actually the same actors. Instead of them being 16, they're now like 40. And they're going, they have some families and then they're still that arch rival. So I just finished season two and waiting for the next one. So I just want to throw that out there. We're almost there to like the all Valley tournament. Ooh. Right? <laughs> so good. Yeah. So right good. now we're still doing some training. We're in Mr. Miyagi's sweet backyard working and learning, but soon we're going to show you how to put, how to put this in place. And that actually reminds me, if you've been following this podcast or watching us on YouTube or Facebook, and if you're ever wondering, well, these policy sounds cool, or, or will they work, or will they work for me, or how do, how do I get one, what you, if you look in our show notes, there will be a link to schedule a 15-minute call with Cameron or I, and we're just kind of talk about what your goals are and whether this is for you and see if we should move forward or not. And if you call Anthony, he'll talk uh, for 15 minutes about Cobra Kai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, do not bring up Cobra Kai when we're on the call. <laughs> I w I'll add here before we jump in is that uh, you and I both have done this over the years, but we've read this book numerous times. And every time I go back and I read it, I learn something else. And this is probably the section of the book that all, I always learn something, right? Is you learn in layers and every time there's just a level of understanding that you gain when you go back and reread it. And this is for the section for me. I, these are human factors. And so I probably learn more about kind of myself when I'm reading this book than anything. And it's this section right here. So I love this part. So. Well, Cameron, why don't you share, was there one little tidbit that stood out that you, after you've probably read this many times, give us an example of one thing that, that stood out for you this time. Yeah, there's five factors in here, and I probably identi I identify with all of them, right, to be totally honest. But the first one, let's, you do. Yeah, let's jump right into, okay, Mr. Arrival Syndrome, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> uh, let's jump right into Parkinson's Law. Is Parkinson's Law is the way that it's defined in the book is work expands to meet the time allowed. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm absolutely guilty of this. I've been guilty of this uh, 
for as, as long as I can remember. I remember in high school and in college, man, if I had a paper that was due right at the end of the month is I wasn't starting that thing till the last week, a few days before. And unfortunately, I kind of pride myself in kind of being able to get things done at those last minute deadlines, right? Just putting mm -hmm. it off. And I pulled many, uh, you start working on those things in the evening, in the afternoons and pulled many all nighters, just trying to make sure I hit those deadlines. So uh, Parkinson's law, I absolutely identify with. Yeah, Parkinson's law for me, this one is is the hardest one that hardest one for me to to conquer. And one thing I noticed just even in, in my day, if if I have say I have five or six appointments back to back, man, I'm in the zone. I am just driven and I'm just I, I'm I'm just performing and, and being very efficient. But if I have two appointments particularly if they're spread out or maybe, you know, on Fridays I try to do an admin day and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to do all these things on, on my admin day. But then when I get there, I don't, I start, I have that tendency to do things that I want that, that aren't important, but something that, that I like doing, you know, and sometimes you put off those important and urgent things to do something that you enjoy doing. And that's something that I struggle with. And where I've seen with my clients, a lot of times, let's just compare this to work expands or to your, or to your lifespan. A lot of times when we're 20, 30 years old, we're like, man, I got plenty of time to start saving and start creating passive income. The next thing you know, you're 40 or 50 years old, and you're like, oh, shoot. Um, I wish I would have saved more or I wish I would have started, started investing more. And, you know, this IBC works really n no matter how old you are. However, the earlier you're, earlier you start, uh, the better. And, and this Parkinson's law can also kind of apply to the saying that a luxury once enjoyed becomes a necessity. And you had just kind of mentioned, um, you know, looking over your lifespan and saving when you're 20, 30 years old. And what came to my mind was I've had this conversation many times with kind of the, some of my younger clients that might be, you know, mid to mid twenties, early thirties. And they're, we're talking about cars and purchasing cars mm -hmm. and they'll come in here and, you know, I'm not here to tell people what to do by any means. Right. I just kind of show them the way on how to, how to finance it or whatever they want to do. But uh, there's conversations that we have just on personal finance. And I'm thinking of one couple, one couple in particular that, we talk probably monthly, right? We check in once a month and we talk about their spending habits and those things and just try to keep them on track. And uh, I love these guys to death. And one time the husband came in and, you know, he's late twenties ish. Right. And, uh, he comes in, he wants to buy a truck. Mm. <laughs> it sounds like my son, <laughs> this truck, he comes in. I'm like, great, man. Tell me about it. Right. This truck is almost $60,000. And mm. I'm like, Oh man. Right. So I'm trying to think of right. How to share or share a story to educate somebody and share some sort of parable. Right. But uh, I always come back to Parkinson's law in this scenario is because a luxury once enjoyed becomes a necessity. And the way that I frame this is I say, okay, listen, if you're 25 years old right now and you go buy and you go out and you buy a $60,000 truck, that's fine. Right. But you're never going to go back and buy a 20 or $25,000 car. You have just raised the bar or your baseline for comparison of every car moving forward up to a 50, $60,000 truck that, has got the seat warmers, right? And here in Vegas, warmers, yeah. yeah, here in Vegas, it's got the seat coolers, right? So mm -hmm. they'll cool you down as well. And then it's also got the steering wheel that'll get cool too. So, right, I mean, that's the idea of a luxury once you enjoyed becomes a necessity is you're, you're, once you um, experience that, that becomes the norm for you now. And just to tag on to that, particularly in regards to cars, when I was looking, I, Karen, you know me, I am not, I'm not a car guy or am I handy? And there's a lot of things that, that there's I'm a, not, there's but, a lot of things you're not, I, but cars really don't, they don't really excite me. I mean, but there was one car I had that I absolutely loved and it was a F it was an FJ cruiser by Toyota. Hmm. Remember those? I do. Right. The first time I, I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what is that? That thing looks super cool. And I ended up, I ended up getting it. 
make a long story short, I ended up rolling it as well with the family in it. Oh, okay. oh wait a minute. We don't have to make that story short. We can come <laughs> back to that and unpack it if you want to. Well, no. Maybe, uh, maybe that'll be a different one. Yeah, but what I will say, the car worked, man. We, we rolled over one and a quarter times. That's scary. And everybody walked out with, well, maybe a, a little scratch from the window, but everybody was fine. And then when I was looking at cars, I really liked the, the Range Rover. That was my dream car. And I almost got it, but man, that is just way too much money to spend on a car. I'm thinking I could buy, you know, spend half that and then take other money by rental, rental property. So I, I didn't get the Range Rover. But I'm like, you know what? That FJ Cruiser I liked, why don't I get another one? You, <laughs> And this is embarrassing to say, but you want to know the reason why I didn't get the FJ Cruiser? They didn't have it in pink? Oh. <laughs> no, you can get them in pink, man. Uh, <laughs> the door, the, 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 the locking system on the doors and the, the ignition switch. The cars I've had before, uh, since the FJ Cruiser, they have the keyless entry. Oh, oh Right? Yeah. So... With the FJ Cruiser, you have to actually take the keys out of your pocket and put it in the door, open it up, and then you have to put them in the, ign in the ignition to start it. But the cars that I've had since then have that keyless entry. Like the one I have before, there was like a button on, on the handle. You have to hit that button to unlock it. But now you don't even have to hit the button. You just got to walk up to it and pull the handle and it opens up. And you walk in and push that button, the whole time the keys are in your pocket. The, the moral of this story is maybe I'm a little high maintenance, <laughs> okay? But, but I enjoyed that luxury of, of the convenience of the keyless entry. And so now I'm not going to get a car unless it has a keyless entry. Mm. Right? Absolutely. One thing I'll add in there on uh, page 28 when he's talking about Parkinson's law as he says, uh, uh, if you can whip Parkinson's law, you will win by default because your peers cannot do this. And everything that we do is compared with everyone else. When I read everything you do is compared with, with everyone else is, I don't read it that I'm comparing myself to you because you're much older than me. <laughs> <laughs> How I read that is that I compare it with my peer group. Is I compare myself and my, my model, what I'm doing financially with, Every other, every other individual that's my age, and I try to analyze and ask myself time and time again, am I being the absolute most efficient with my resources that I possibly can? And so I don't compare myself to somebody that's five years, 10 years older than me, that may be very much more successful than I am. I do compare myself to others in my age group and see where I'm at. And uh, I don't know, I, I just wanted to share that. Well, you know, when you say that, Cameron, to me, it reminds me of the old saying, keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. And I know, I know that you don't do that, but can you expand on that when, how you're comparing what you're doing of not trying to keep up? Really good question is I'm not trying to keep up on consumption, right? Is I'm not trying to purchase a whole bunch of stuff that I don't need conspicuous consumption. Those things is I look at my plan is my plan is I am, I'm in this for the long game, right? I'm not trying to go and retire in 10 years, in 10 years and 15 years is, my mentality on what I'm trying to do is I am producing, I am cultivating a skill set that is only going to get better in 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years. And my, you know, it'd be ridiculous for me to think that I'm going to back out of this career in, fifth, when I'm in 15 years from now, 20 years from now. I'm going to be a way better advisor at that point than I ever would be or than I am today. And so I'm not sure how to answer that, but I'm in this for the long game. I'm in this to cultivate a skill set that's going to provide for me and my family for a very long time. But then also the model that I'm building by using the infinite banking strategy is a model that's going to provide for me way past retirement, but then also provide for my kids mm -hmm. and also provide for my children's children. Right. And so I, I, the, the word that comes back to me is just long game is this is not about getting to retirement and stopping and hitting cruise control is I am building, I am, uh, you know, I'm putting a model in place that can be perpetuated for, for myself and for my kids. You know, let me add something talking about you, Cameron, just to clarify, I don't want anybody to get the, the wrong impression 
because again, when I first heard that, I'm thinking of you competing up to the Joneses. And even if you're comparing yourselves to other people in your, your young age, you, your priorities are not the norm of this world or of this country. Like you, you're a big family man and you prioritize more time with the family than you do making money. So I just want to make sure that, that that's clear as far as when you are comparing it. Like I, I know you very well and that's why I respect you. Ooh, did I say that? And, mm. Okay. I'm going to edit Rewind. that out. I'm going to edit that out. But you know, you brought up a very good point, right? Yeah. Um, well, th thank you. And uh, let's, let's jump right into uh, kind of the second human factor. What do you think? Well, did we, men did we go through expenses rise equal income? Oh, I don't think we did. Right. Yeah. So one of the things you talked about with Parkinson's law, well, and just to clarify, if you haven't read the book, if you haven't, I would highly suggest that, that you do read the book. And we're going to have a link in the show notes for you to buy it on Amazon. But Parkinson's Law was actually a, a book written by... Do you need your readers? No, <laughs> I have mine on. Uh, Northcote Parkinson. So it has nothing to do with the devastating disease. It's actually uh, a author of, of a book. And he talked about some of these hu human laws. And one of them he talked about is expenses rise to income. And like, I remember this when I graduated college. I just, man, you know, now that I have a career and I have like a, a real job, I'm going to be loaded. I've never made th this amount of money, mm. right? Uh, now looking at that amount of money, m my, my lifestyle is much more than what it was when somebody coming right out of college. And we have that tendency that as soon as we get that raise, well, maybe the next car we're looking at is a little bit nicer. Maybe the vacations we go to, instead of going to Disneyland, maybe we're going to Cancun. Or just, we, we just start increasing our expenses to meet our income. And the problem is when we do that, we're never going to get ahead. You know, it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. And that's one of the things that he's talked about. And to be honest, I have... I've struggled with that uh, as well. And even being a business owner where your income is it, uh, fluctuates. Like what I've done and I tell a lot of my clients where their income is up and down is, you know, you live off a certain amount of money each month and then anything extra you save. Either you save it in reserves for a rainy day or you reinvest in your corporation or maybe you use some of that extra money for extra trips. But we need to be good stewards of our money and when we start making more, that doesn't mean that we should be spending more. Really good point. I, and not to, I, we've kind of done a really good job here, but I do want to add, I, I literally just thought of a story. I remember when I was uh, going to school in high school and I just graduated. I was going to work for UPS. I remember getting that first paycheck and I remember standing in the living room and I opened it up and I looked at it and it was a couple hundred bucks, right? For a week's worth of work. And I remember sitting there and the first thing that a family member said to me was, Hey, if you took that money and you went, uh, or if you took that paycheck every week or one of those a month, you could go buy a new car. And that was like the first thing that was told to me. So what did I do? <laughs> I went buy a new car. <laughs> It wasn't new by any means, but it's new to me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just the, the mindset again when we're, when we're talking about learning, right? Where are we learning? Where are we getting our financial education from? Is it lateral, right, for people around us that uh, may not be the best off? Or, or are we looking at somebody that's been there, done that? So. so the next law Nelson talks about is he calls it Willie Sutton Law. Willie Sutton was a notorious bank robber. And he was asked this question, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where, that's where they keep the money. The point of this law with Nelson is taking is that wherever money resides, somebody is going to want to take it. And what he discusses mostly is regarding to the government and, and the IRS. And he, he explained it, it uh, this way, which, which I thought was a pretty unique way, is that 
is that if I went in, into the mall and I held a gun up to somebody and I said, give me all your money, everybody around there is going to call me a thief that I am taking that person's money. But if I went to the mall an hour earlier and I talked with everybody who was there, I said, okay, here's the plan. I'm going to pull the gun out and I'm going to empty out his wallet. And then I'm going to give a little bit to each one of you. Would they call that, would they still call me a thief? Or what Nelson says, that's what they call democracy. And I think what Nelson is trying to make a point of is that you need to be, you worked hard for that money. And one of the biggest eroders of wealth is going to be taxes. So we need to have a plan and a strategy to minimize the impact that taxes are going to have on your wealth. What I'll add to that right there is uh, what I, what comes to mind when I think of Willie Sutton's law is uh, right. Wherever you have wealth is somebody's going to try to come and steal it, right. And take it from you. But also it's uh, when you put money somewhere on deposit is you're entering into an agreement with who's holding that money. And most qualified plans, right, from a 30,000-foot level is, right, there's some of my money that's in there, and then there's some of the money that I just haven't chosen to pay the IRS yet. And when I enter into that type of agreement, where does all the control lie over that account, Anthony? Is that with me, or is that with somebody else dictating it to me? It's with somebody else, including the government. Right? And what they do, right, and this, again, my perspective, is what they do is they will put money on it, uh, they will put money on deposit, uh, they will put restrictions on you getting that money and then they create exceptions, right? So, hey, you can have your money in a 401k and IRA if you meet some of these types of criteria. And when I look at the, the option of the route that I've chosen of keeping my money on deposit with insurance companies and high, va high cash value life insurance is who owns, Anthony, you know this, who owns, who dictates the control of that money? You do. I do. Right? right. When you look at a contract, right, that's laid out in that in that policy is I'm number one. I'm the guy that's making the calls on the premiums that go in there on the loan repayment schedules, uh, the access to money. I call them up and I tell them to send me my money. They don't ask any questions. They just say, how quickly do you want it? Right. So there's a, a whole different element of control between these two things. And I my personality type is I have no interest in playing that game of kind of playing by their rules is. I like to have my money on deposit over here and I like to have access to it whenever I need it. Right. And he, right. And not, Nelson talks about the, the government was, the IRS was not even around or income tax was not even around until 1913. The government had, did not have a national debt. They were still doing well, but now all of a sudden they start taxing and you know what? It is never it is never enough. And Nelson talks about how the government created a problem with these high taxes, and then, and then they try to create a solution with an IRA or 401k. And that creates even more problems because the government is in control of, of when you can access that money and how much, and how much you can put in. And I'm sure we'll do a podcast specifically on the pros and cons of qualified plans and qualified plans are like an IRA or, or 401k. But when I talk to somebody about what their goals are, when you dive deep, their goal isn't to be a millionaire or they may think that's a goal at the beginning, but really what their goal is, is to create cash flow. And so we need, if that's truly your goal is to create cash flow and ideally passive income, then we need to make financial decisions that are going to help you achieve those goals. And a qualified plan is not a great place to create passive income. Agreed hundred percent. What you mentioned in there was kind of the problem is taxation, right? That they mm -hmm. created. And so we've got two upcoming podcasts that are going to be addressing these two scenarios. So upcoming these are going to be really, really good. You guys are going to want to make sure that you subscribe and listen to these. But uh, we've got a gentleman, Todd Martis, from Capital Preservation Services that we're going to be interviewing shortly. Anthony, do you, do you want to share anything on, on Capital Preservation Services briefly? Um, 
I'm real excited about having Todd on here. I've actually flown out to his office and have met with him and his wife and been and been to his house. And what he's going to share, and we'll go more into it when, yeah. when he's there, but I, I just kind of give you a, maybe a, a little teaser. There's things that CPAs know, but they don't know the whole picture. And And I can say that because... Todd explained some strategies to me that, that I thought I knew how they worked. I'm like, you know what, that really does not make sense or is not going to be a, be a big advantage. But Todd showed me a different way to look at it and a different strategy, strategy to use, the, to use to maximize the, the tax code the current laws to, to lower the taxes. So he's going to, he's going to be a wealth of knowledge. I'm really excited for him to be joining our podcast. And thank you. Anthony. And the second gentleman that I was referencing is uh, when you're talking about the current tax code, excuse me, when we're talking about the current tax code, tax code and where the tax code needs to go or potentially will be going mm -hmm. is we've got a gentleman by the name of David McKnight, which I've been a, a big fan of this gentleman for several years now. He wrote a book that's called The Power of Zero. He also produced a movie that's called uh, The Power of Zero, The Tax Train is Coming. And I think we're going to have some of this, uh, some of those materials available for our listeners. Mm -hmm. And if you guys want some of that, you guys need to read this, uh, get into it, read the book, watch the video prior to him coming on, and we can ask questions on your behalf. We've got a bunch of our questions that we're going to be asking him, but I am really, really excited about having David McKnight on the show. I've watched the tax train a few times and it's, it's, it, man, it, he does, he does a very good job. And what he talks about is the situation of what, where we're at with our national debt and how we got here. One of the interesting things I thought everybody focuses on the tax rate, right? Of taxes or cutting taxes or increasing taxes. But if you really look at the IRS, well, the government, Maybe a business isn't the right example because they're not really generating money. They're actually taking it. But if you just look at their profit and loss statement, they have money coming in, which is part of it. And that's an important piece. But there's also money going out, which is just as important. Similar to what we talked about uh, in regards to Parkinson's law. It's not how much you make. It's how much you keep. The same thing goes for the government. We spend so much time on tax revenue, but if you look at the numbers, the, the, what's really gone out of whack is not so much the income, it's our expenses. Our expenses are going, are increasing at a much higher rate than our income. Great DVD, and we will be having a link in, in the show notes for you to order that. I think what we're going to do is, is, is we're going to buy some and then we'll have a link where you, where you can get it for free, but you will, you will need to pay shipping, shipping and handling, but it should be under 10 bucks, but definitely worth 10 bucks and 45 minutes of your time to learn about the tax train. Absolutely. These two guys are going to be great podcasts. I'm excited. Before we move on to the next rule, which is my favorite rule, one of, the, one of the many advantages of storing wealth inside a life insurance policy is I like to say that it's protected from creditors, predators, and senators. Mm -hmm. Let's open a little giggle at that. But you know, with Willie Sutton's law, it's important that wherever you have money, somebody is going to go after it. And I know we talk a lot about taxes, but also... Every state has at least some level of asset protection of the cash value, meaning you put the money inside your policy and you get sued, whether it's from a business transaction, maybe a tenant on a rental property, or maybe you're from, from a car accident. Many states actually have it so 100%, okay, 100% of your cash value will be protected if you were to get sued. Love it. Good point. Good point. Thanks for sharing that, Anthony. I'm being sincere. I was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's move on. Now we've got, uh, let's go uh, move along with uh, Nelson here to, let's go to page 31 where mm. he's talking about the golden rule. And I think just about everybody understands the golden rule. The golden rule is he who has the gold makes all the rules. 
How does that apply to kind of what we're talking about here, Anthony? This is my favorite role. Okay. Okay. Because it's kind of funny because everybody, I always ask people, do you know the golden rule? Well, you should treat others mm. like you should treat yourself. Definitely true, right? But we're using it in a different context. Whoever has the gold makes the rule. Where I like to use this, well, I have used this, I've used this with my kids. Ooh, okay. Right? So yeah. I don't know about your kids, but sometimes my kids want, they, they want money. Oh, my kids right? never do. Well, they, well, not they want money. They want my money. Yeah. And then with no strings attached. They want handouts. Yeah. So I kind of tell them, you know, it's a golden rule. It's, it's funny when, when you explain it to them the first time, right? He who has the gold has the rules. If, so if I'm going to help finance your college, I, I tell you one rule I had, which my daughter hates. No tattoos. Oh, okay. Okay. And we could go in, but I, I, our, our, our deal is no tattoo until you finish your education and you're 25. Okay. My, my, my hope is by the time you're 25, you're like, <laughs> man, you know, tattoos really are not that cool. But at least when you're 25, I think you're more mature than when you're like 20. Yeah. To be okay. able to make such a permanent decision. But that's the golden rule you want my gold, you have to follow, you, you, you have to follow the rules. When I think of uh, the golden rule, I was thinking about buying a house, right? Because mm -hmm. most people don't have enough cash to buy houses. And so that process typically looks like somebody going to a bank and applying for a loan and they will give you their rule book, right? <laughs> it's about six to eight inches thick and you've got to sign 150 times or I don't even know how many as you go through that, but they're stating all the rules that you must play by to have access to their money, right? That is the position that I want to be in, right? In my life is I don't mm -hmm. like giving up control. And so um, that's the example that I usually share with clients when we're talking about the golden rule. On the other, we kind of touched on this too, is the idea of economic value added is capital has a cost, right? And so when someone is, it doesn't matter if it's your money or my money is there's a cost to capital. And so these things kind of work in conjunction with, um, you know, who's got the, who's got the gold makes all the rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what uh, a friend of mine, Patrick stated it, stated it this way when talking about banks is that banks are like your neighbor who will loan you an umbrella when mm -hmm. it's sunny out. And then first drop of rain, there's a knock on your door. Hey, buddy, hey, neighbor, you know that umbrella that I loaned you? Well, you know what? I need it back, <laughs> right? Banks do the same way with, with, their, with, with their rule book. You have to be very careful. I'm not saying that you should never borrow money. Like I've used it particularly ideally to buy assets, but you just have to know going in that, you, that if you're using their gold, you're going to use, you, you have to follow their rules. Once we've, once we've amassed or once we've kind of collected a pile of gold, right, money, what will typically happen is you will start to see, right, your, your mindset changes. You will start to identify opportunities that you didn't see before. There's a name for this, and I forget it. I knew at one point, but I got to go look it up. But it's very similar to like when you buy a new car, right? You, you drive Right. Yeah, you drive a, I won't even say it cause it's a very nice car, but you drive, <laughs> you drive a nice car, you buy, go buy a new car. Let's say you buy a Ford Mustang and you know, the couple of weeks prior, you never saw a Ford Mustang. The day you drive it off the lot and you're driving home, you see 14 Ford Mustangs go by and you're like, where'd all these cars come from? Yeah. Right. It's the same thing with money is when you're in a position of cash, opportunities will present themselves. Totally agree. And I'm going to add something to it. And what I like to say is the bigger, the better, the bigger, the opportunity, the smaller the window of time for you to take advantage of it. That's why it's important to have some liquidity. So when those, when that big opportunity comes, you have the cash to take advantage of it. We've been talking a lot lately with hard money lenders and kind of scenarios who have clients that have kind of reached out and are looking for that money. But uh, the golden rule, right, is, is very prevalent in that scenario is you got somebody that's looking for money and typically they're looking for, they're not looking for what's called institutional money, which is very cheap, but it can be very onerous to go and get. 
they're looking for private money, which on the other hand can be very expensive. And what you typically see in that scenario is somebody comes and you'll make an introduction, right? And you'll say, hey, this guy is a hard money lender. He's got some cash that he wants to loan out and you need some cash. So let's make the introduction. And then somebody calls back and they go like, he wanted how much for that money? <laughs> like, Bro, he's, he's got all the money. He makes the rules, right? That's what the going rate is for money today. And so it's always funny just that dialogue when people get started looking at that industry. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, what else we got in here? So the next is the arrival syndrome. Well, real quick, let me oh, back sorry. up. Is uh, yeah, the arrival, and this is really good because uh, uh, on page thirty-two, Nelson's got a couple of things in here, but he talks about um, what I wrote down was I'm trying to look for the the paragraph, but uh, the idea or the thought that I had when I was reading page thirty-two is the idea between self-sufficiency and self-reliance right? Is, hmm. Expand it, on that. Yeah. So, there, so there's a, a big difference and I have it in my notes and, I, and what I've got here is what's the difference and then I've got some notes written down. Self-sufficiency is being able to or being in the position to provide for your own needs as opposed to kind of self-reliance. Reliance is the ability to provide for yourself and others, bringing others up and along with you. And so, Whenever I hear self-sufficiency is I don't want to live a life of sufficiency of just being able to take care of myself is I want to create wealth that brings other people along with that and help other people out. So, um, I, you know, I got to look back and, on nice. the sentence on which is in there, but I want to make sure I shared that with the listeners. It's a big difference between uh, those two wordings and it's subtle, but uh, it's got a profound meaning for me. Now we may, we may oh, yeah. proceed. So the, the arrival syndrome to me, Th this one I found has been the biggest obstacle for someone to be open to the infinite banking concept. Very true. And, that, and to make the make it real short, the rival syndrome is, Hey, I already know everything. There isn't anything, there isn't anything else to learn. A prime example for this is when I first when I first heard about IBC, I wanted to share it with a friend of mine who was a, who was a CFO and also a CPA. The CPAs are very difficult. A, a lot of CPAs have, are, are suffering from the arrival syndrome. This one, he, he, was, he was trying to conquer it, but he couldn't. He read the book. We spent numerous meetings this might be a surprise, Karen, but he created some spreadsheets what? to, to analyze the numbers. And you want to know what he told me at the end? He said, I can't tell you that this won't work, but I can't tell you that it does. Hmm. And diving into him, and you know, I actually, when I first heard about this, I went to other uh, traditional financial planners, and they would always tell me this, this uh, doesn't work. But fortunately, I, and I probably had the rival syndrome in 2008, but I think uh, 2008 really kind of uh, cured me of the arrival syndrome. And fortunately, I was open to learn some other ideas. And this thing, if, if you think you already know everything, man, there, there's so much more knowledge out there. Whether, whether it's, just forget about IBC, but just whether it is with technology or different ways to do business or better ways to raise your kids or to treat with the environment or to take advantage of, of tax strategies, if you have those blinders on and are not willing to learn new things, it's going to be very difficult to be successful. I agree. One of the things I wrote down was uh, we have a, a, a podcast interview coming up with a gentleman named Alexander Felice. He has uh, cut out a very good niche for himself in, in real estate. But, uh, man, I love talking to that guy and people like him because he is a voracious reader. He reads books upon books upon books, and it's just amazing. I love having conversations with people that, that value learning and never stop, right? That continued education piece. I, I love that. And that's kind of what's drawn me to this whole industry of, of infinite, infinite banking is a lot of people in this industry are, are like that. They, they have that thirst for knowledge. Agreed. Agreed. 
Anything more on the on the arrival syndrome? Let's see here. Uh, uh, last note I got for the arrival syndrome is, again, is this is our hardest job is to get people to think bigger and better. And when people do kind of take our ideas and our strategies is we're, we're trying to get them to expand their mind as they have an idea of what they want to do when we start. But you kind of mentioned a minute ago is we have no idea what the future is going to look like for us. Mm -hmm. And getting ourselves in a position of cash allows us to act on those opportunities. And we just don't know what they are right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So last thing I'll add there. Yeah, and the last one that we're going to talk about is, is use it or lose it. This is on page 35. And this whole idea of use it or lose it, when I read, when I read this piece, is it, may, it reminds me of, of a book that I've read and that I absolutely love. It's one of my favorite. You guys, if you're listening to this, write this down. This is a book by Nassim Nicholas Tlaib, and it's called Anti-Fragile. But the, but the idea behind this, uh, his book kind of ties into this, is that use it or lose it, which means that, um, or hey, so let me start over, is that the, the premise behind anti-fragile is that everyone understand what fragile and fragility means is if you have an object that you put under stress and pressure, pressure, it will crack and it'll break. Everyone believes that the opposite of that is resilience. So if you have an object and you put it under stress and pressure, that it will withstand that pressure. The opposite of fragility is going to be anti-fragile. And what that means is that this object needs that pressure or that stress to get bigger and better. An example of, that he talks about in his book is he talks about churches that have been around for 500 years and they're just getting better because they're made of rock and stone and they're just settling in on themselves and they, they're not going anywhere, right? Another example is the human body or most human bodies, right? Is if I go and, <laughs> if I, go and I work out uh, the, through conditioning is I'm going to get bigger and stronger. And it's the same thing with this situation or this strategy is that if we have policies in place and we're using them, they get better. And that is a, it's a very difficult concept for most people to get or to grasp early on is because we're not used to it, right? We're, we're used to things that if we use them a lot is they wear down and they break, right? If you think of other insurance products is you don't want to use it. You don't want to use your car insurance because the prices are going to go up, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a very difficult concept, but when I use, when I read this, it's use it or lose it. And I look forward to kind of the next portion of this book is because we're going to show you through numbers, right? That the more you use this strategy, the better it gets. Right. Good segue. Cause one thing that, that Nelson had talked about, well, a couple of things. One is that in this section, it's not about interest rates. Everybody focus on, well, what's the rate of return on this? What's the return on this policy or what's the return on this investment? Or as you'd mentioned, a hard money lender, they're focusing on the rates of return. But until, until I can pay for food and medical care with rates of return, I'm going to focus on dollars. Dollars is, is what's going to put food on the table. Dollars are going to, what's going to allow me to live the lifestyle that, that I want to do. Nobody has control about interest rates. And when we use this policy, interest rates and even the performance of the insurance company is not nearly as important of how you use it. I think that's where he's talking about use it or lose it. You have that cash value there that is just ready and liquid. And if you use that to invest or you use that to pay off debt, and then you take that cash flow that that created or freed up, and paid back, you're going to use the velocity of money and your, your policy and your wealth is going to grow. And one thing, a good line that Nelson had, had said, I'm going, to, I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. Anytime you can cut out the payment of interest to others and direct that same market rate of interest to an entity that you own and control, which is subject to minimal taxation because the insurance companies do pay tax, but then you have improved your situation. And that, that's what Nelson talks a lot about is redirecting interest that you were paying to others. But I know that there's some listeners out there who's like, well, I pay everything in cash. I never use credit. What we have created is, is you know, we like to say that, that we do the math and we're going to create a quick little video that's going to explain the how much cash you can have by financing things just using the savings account 
or even, or even if you pay yourself interest, maybe you're like, man, I don't need, that sounds cool, but I don't need a life insurance policy. I'm just going to pay myself interest using somebody else's bank. Well, we're going to do, we're going to do a video on that, 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 that will do the math showing you that, because uh, at the bottom line, it's not about rates. It's about how much dollars you're going to have in your pocket at the end of the day. So we're put that in the show notes. And that's also a precursor to, I believe, the next chapter when Nelson is talking about uh, ways to finance cars, either using a CD method like somebody else's bank or creating your own banking system. The important thing is that at the end of the day, it's about which what, which product or solution is going to help you have more cash at the end of the day? Awesome. Great. So thanks guys for listening. Uh, again, if you've got any questions on anything that you've heard today, go ahead and check out the show notes where we've got links to uh, book a 15 minute meeting with Anthony or myself and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Go make it a fantastic day. Take care. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode. Also, check out our website, InfiniteWealthConsultants.com, to find our podcast along with other additional resources.